there's some very, very, very useful medicines in Russian olive. As far as I know, hardly anyone in this country uses them. But in Central Asia, they're used, and they have been used for thousands and thousands of years because they're very effective medicines. We have basically, uh, besides the nutritional components we'll talk about, which is, it's a very nutritional plant used as a tea that you can drink. It also has some special medicines, three main ones. We have one called uh, beta carboline. We have beta carotene. You can get those confused because they're similar, but uh, beta carboline is one medicine not related to beta carotene, which is another antioxidant that's uh, usually found in other vegetables that have a yellow color. Quercetin, which is an antioxidant also. So we have these three main medicinal qualities in all parts of the plant. They concentrate in different parts of the plant at different times. So this time of the year, we'd harvest the leaves, which have the beta uh, carboline. It's an amazing chemical because it's it occurs in other plants. It's not unusual for a plant to have beta carboline in it. What's unusual is the concentration of it in this plant is much higher than you'd find it in other plants. That makes it medicinal for treating conditions that are basically a deficiency of beta carboline in the diet, which is very common in American diets. If you ate wild foods, foods that grow in the mountains as native plants, you would get lots of it but because we don't do that anymore. Native people now have an American diet, which is uh, vegetables that come from monoculture farms, which are notoriously deficient in a lot of the uh, antioxidants and nutrients that would be common in wild plants. So this is a way of supplementing the diet with something that's very, very common. So beta carboline Probably its most notable effect is as a neuroprotective chemical. Your body produces beta carboline, and when I say that term, it's, it's a way to identify a broad spectrum of chemicals called alkaloids that animals produce, mammals produce it, and plants produce it. But they're protective of the neuro, uh, neurological tissues. So they're protective of brain tissue, they protect the nerve sheath, and they are uh, supportive of synaptic neurotransmitters like serotonin uh, and noradrenaline. These are compounds that allow your synapses, parts of the nervous system that conduct messages, from one part of the body to the other to, a func to function more efficiently. This plant actually, the leaves at this stage, contain these compounds that improve your neurologic function. So this is a plant that actually reverses some of the effects of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, alcoholism, and some other uh, things like malnutrition that can affect your brain function. So it improves memory. It improves your cognitive abilities, your ability to learn rapidly. This is something which would be very important for children, especially on the reservation where diets may not be perfect. They may not be adequate, really, because of uh, financial needs sometimes. Um, plants that can substitute for What's missing in a poor diet can be very useful as medicines that are easy to take as a tea. You can mix this with other teas that have more flavor because it's not particularly flavorful tea. But this was traditional with tribes to mix medicinal plants with teas that were drunk for a specific purpose. So that's one of the main uh, attributes to Russian olive is the neuroprotective aspect of the leaf tea. When these berries get ripe, 
uh, around the end of September, maybe even October, they turn reddish. And when they do, that means they're at their highest level, according to studies done in Iran today, where this is a highly prized medicine, even though we don't recognize it as that. In Iran, where this tree is in nat is native species, Central Asia, they use this plant as a medicinal tea. And there's a lot of research going on now to actually use it to slow down, interrupt the process that leads to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, so these berries will turn red and they can be harvested in great quantities. If we're going to be cutting these trees down as a control measure, we should be collecting these berries at the time we cut them down and save them. You can dry them and then rehydrate them as a food or as a tea. Some of these berries were put into food traditionally in the uh, ancient knowledge of the Persian tribes and used for flavoring. The berries are not bad tasting. They're just not commonly used and their texture is a little different than we're used to. But they can be put into stews and soups as a flavoring and used that way. Boiling doesn't hurt these medicinal components. One of the other medicinal components in the berries once they ripen, which are also in the leaves right now. So I collect these leaves right at this stage. This is late summer, late August. The leaves are, and the stems are actually concentrating these chemicals which are produced in the lower parts of the plant and eventually migrate into the berries. So at this stage, the leaves have these medicinal components which are antioxidants, which means they're good to prevent lipid peroxidation, which is the cause of many common diseases like cardiovascular disease and certainly is Im implicated in cancer and uh, poor eyesight, uh, capillary fragility, many, many broad spectrum diseases and ailments that are related to peroxidation of the blood. This, the antioxidants in this plant, neutralize that peroxidation and give you a longer lifespan, uh, better clarity of thought, cognitive improvements, memory improvements, but also better heart function and a resistance to cancer. So this is listed in the uh, um, Persian lexicon of medicinals as an anti-neoplastic uh, treatment, which means it prevents cancer from starting in the first place. And cancer is a big problem, especially amongst people of low income and poor diet. So it's something to think about. The, the chemical that's in the leaves right now and will concentrate in the berries in a few months, September and October, is called iliagnin. Iliagnin affects the blood in a positive way by uh, reducing the level of lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation is when you oxidize the metabolites, the byproducts of digesting food, which are in your blood, they're in all of your tissues. Normally your body through good nutrition would neutralize the oxides so that they don't do any damage. But in the American diet we have, uh, we have fungicides, we have pesticides, we have all sorts of food additives which uh, limit our body's defenses against peroxidation. So we have a very high disease rate in the United States and other civilized countries, so-called civilized countries <laughs> that uh, have an advanced agriculture. And the modern agriculture depends on things like pesticides and herbicides. So we have to get around the negative effects of herbicides, pesticides, and food additives and the way you do it is with antioxidants because it's the oxidizing of the blood and the tissues uh, of the cardiovascular system that really cause most of our medical problems. At least they're at the 
baseline uh, formative level of the conditions that result in disease. So uh, this is one of the best plants we can actually harvest for that. There are native plants too that are harder to collect. Iliagnin, the uh, antioxidant I was just talking about, reduces blood pressure, uh, relieves oxidative stress, which as I said is at the foundation level of a lot of ailments and diseases that we get and therefore reduces the medical bills that people will have if, if this is something you could add to the diet once or twice a week. So reducing blood pressure is an important thing and that's accomplished by this antioxidant called iliagnine native to Russian thistle leaves but more importantly berries in the fall so we should be harvesting these berries when they turn yellowish and then reddish orange colored but for right now we should also be harvesting the leaves so if we're cutting these trees down to control them and make our meadows more natural again we should be saving all of the leaves that we can dry them put them in bags for storage and use them for tea in uh, the winter and through the rest of the year. If we're cutting in the fall of the year, we should save the berries when they mature and collect those and dry them and add them to stews and soups and improve the health dramatically of the people that um, live around the Wind River Reservation and where these trees are so abundant. We also have quercetin uh, in these plants at high levels. And uh, quercetin is a fungicide. It's natural in the diet. Many plants, plants contain quercetin. But the levels of quercetin in this plant are very high. It's not only uh, a fungicide, so it protects you from things like candidiasis, yeast infections, yellow toenail fungus, athlete's foot, all of these different things that are common would never occur if we had enough quercetin in our diet. In the native diets before pre in the pre-reservation times, there was plenty of quercetin in the diet. It was always there. It's a natural way to uh, prevent uh, anaerobic bacteria from getting into the gut and causing all sorts of autoimmune diseases and other digestive problems, but also yeast infections, fungal infections that are so common today wouldn't occur with a diet adequate in quercetin. So a tea made of the leaves of this plant are very beneficial for that. Even the bark of this uh, Russian olive contains quercetin. So a tea was made from the bark in Persia in ancient times. We can do the same. Uh, right now you would use the leaves. If we're harvesting these trees, it'd be very easy to collect the leaves from the tree um, and save them by drying them. Very easy process. Same with the berries. Quercetin also inhibits uh, platelet aggregation, which is a problem with blood clotting and other ailments, um, hemorrhaging, um, stroke, things like that. This can inhibit those kinds of symptoms by added, adding adequate levels of quercetin to the diet. So you can see this amazing plant in all the different levels of uh, health. And on the nutritional level, it contains high levels of vi B vitamins, vitamin K, which is usually low in American diets today. And it has minerals that are important in high concentrations. So we don't usually get enough of these minerals in our normal American diet. Things like uh, potassium, calcium, uh, chromium. Chromium deficiencies have been linked to uh, prediabetes in young people because nobody puts chromium back into the soil when it's removed. It's one of those trace minerals that's important but in high yield agriculture, what you're putting back in is fertilizers that have 
potassium and phosphorus and nitrogen into the soil, but you're not including chromium. So chromium, selenium, uh, copper, cobalt, those are things that are in this plant in high levels that will supplement nutrition on a very um, base basement level. In other words, in the liver. The liver needs these trace minerals and mega minerals uh, like calcium and uh, potassium in order to make enzymes. And those are the really the groundwork for good nutrition is those nutrients. So this is an amazing plant. Those are the things that make this plant worthy of collecting at the time we're controlling them on uh, sub-irrigated meadows, floodplains, and pastures, whether they have livestock on them or just we want to open them up for growing natural plants that belong there or used to be there. Uh, we shouldn't ignore the nutritive value of this plant when we're controlling them by cutting them down.